Marcella, thank you earlier. Christiana, thank you as well. And, and thank you guys. Uh, I'm wondering where Karen is. She's with her family. Her little granddaughters are being baptized today. So I think, I think that's an excused absence from church. Right? I think she, so this is an exciting thing for those little twins uh, that profess faith in Jesus Christ and how they are uh, going to be baptized today. So we rejoice with them uh, in that. You know, uh, the first church where a pastor is in a small little town called Seaboard, North Carolina. And around the parsonage, there were all these pecan trees, depending on where you're from, pecan trees, whichever, however way you want to say that, but pecan, we're being sophisticated here, called pecan trees. But it was an amazing thing. They didn't always have fruit on them, but when they did, boy, my goodness. We had more pecans if you knew what to do with it. Got a little pecan picker to pick them up. Ended up with like just loads and loads of pecans. But I learned something about harvesting pecans. That not every little hole that you see has fruit inside it. Not every little piece of uh, the, the, the outer shell actually has something because you could pick them up and they would be light. And you find there's a little hole in it. And some little critter had got to it, some insect or something like that, and there was nothing there. On the outside, it looked like a perfectly good pecan, but on the inside, there was nothing there. You know, when I think about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, I wonder if we're not the works of the flesh aren't like those empty pecan shells, right? It looks good. But on the inside, there is nothing there. And so as we go through our sermon series here, the fruit of the Spirit, harvesting spiritual fruit, today we're going to look at the positive aspect. Last week, as I mentioned, it was just kind of depressing to talk about the works of the flesh. I mean, you think about uh, those things that are not pretty to look at or consider or to think about. But today we're going to look at the positive side of what we're to do, and that is to display the fruit of the Spirit. So in honor of God's word, let's stand. We're going to read Galatians uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, pray that you would take this word and write it upon our hearts. May we live this out, Lord, each and every day. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. In his precious and holy name we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. So yeah, thinking about the fact that we're to display spiritual fruit is to show a sign of spiritual maturity because it's a gift of God. Now the works of the flesh are things that we do. And it's interesting when you look at the works of the flesh, many of those are in plural form. You know, hatreds, dissensions, factions. It's, it's in the plural form because it's things that we generate and do ourselves. And sometimes, unfortunately, if we do it in an ongoing fashion, we show that we do not belong in the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, notice it's singular, it's kind of like these all come together. And I want you to understand something. You have these qualities in your life. If you have professed faith in Jesus Christ, you have been transformed by the Holy Spirit, you possess all nine of these qualities. They, they are there. You may say, well, I don't have a whole lot of patience. Well, maybe because you're covering it up with something. But we need to understand that we are to display spiritual fruit and the Lord is looking to harvest spiritual fruit. Again, going back to that first little church that we uh, were part of, this uh, pastor, this is a farming community, and I realized that there were a lot of things that could hinder a harvest. There were a lot of things that could get in the way of that farmer actually being able to get the, the crop in. It could be weather. I mean, it could be too much rain. Not enough rain. It could be too hot. It could be too cold. I mean, if the plants came up and they were just at a certain point, just as it's coming out of the ground and it frost, sorry, no crop that year. That thing was damaged. 
Or if you harvested the peanuts and you put them out, and then the frost came, your quality of peanut just went way down and you just lost a whole lot of money. And so there's no guarantee on the harvest there, but there are a lot of things that could hinder the harvest. And so could it could be the weather, could it be disease, some disease that attacks certain plants that, that can happen. If you have a, tomatoes a few years ago, it was hard to grow tomatoes because there was some, what, there was some insect or bug or something, some disease that was keeping those from blooming and, and producing fruit. It could be bad seed. You know, maybe the farmer planted bad seed and it never grew, but we know that's not the case in spiritual fruit because it's what? Good seed, the good seed of the Holy Spirit, of the Word of God. Maybe sometimes what could hinder the harvest was broken in the equipment. Maybe his tractor was busted. Maybe the thing that he needed, that combine, he couldn't get it out into the field. And there's only a certain period of time. If you don't get out there at the right time, you're not going to get the harvest. Maybe there was just no workers. Maybe, you know, people didn't show up for work that day. Jesus actually commands us, pray the Lord of the harvest, what, to send out laborers into his harvest. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful. So those could hinder the harvest. Sometimes government policies could hinder the harvest. Because they could say, hey, don't plant this, plant that instead. Or, or hey, don't plant anything at all. And it could hinder how much was actually produced. So let me ask you this, what is hindering a spiritual harvest in your life? Is it the circumstances of life, like the, the weather? Is there some disease, illness that you have that's keeping you from focusing upon the Lord? You're focusing more on yourself? Is there something that's broken that's in your life? And, and maybe even it's just your car is broken, and that has just got you so totally derailed that you can't even think about displaying the, the fruit of the Spirit. Or is it maybe what's going on in our culture, the government, and things like that? It, it helps, you know, takes our mind off of the kingdom of God. I don't know what it might be that would hinder the spiritual harvest in your life, but work to remove those things. Those things are not to be there because why? All followers of Jesus have received these qualities. If you don't hear anything else this morning, understand that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you possess the fruit of the Spirit. All the fruit of the Spirit. Not just this part or that part. Now when you go through this and you try to sit here and put these out into different categories, it's really hard to do. But again, being a Baptist preacher, you've got to have three points at least. I know sometimes I have four or five or six points, you know, dependent. But you know, I'm going to try to break these down a little bit, but really there's no breakdown, okay? I'm just breaking it down so it's a little easier to present the information. But they all flow together. It's one total bunch, right? It's not like pick this, pick that. No, it's one. But I want to start out with this by saying there are foundational qualities that we receive. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are given foundational qualities. Think of those first three that are listed there in the fruit of the Spirit. Go back to verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Those sound pretty foundational qualities, right? Those are things that obviously are gifts from God that we possess. And when you think about love, love is really the foundation of the whole thing. What are we told to do? We are told to, to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, right? And our neighbor as ourselves, and also our, our strength, to love the Lord our God. With everything that we are, we are to love Him. That's Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40. It's called the Great Commandment. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, we are told that what God is love. God is love. That's the essential quality of His nature. And if we have a new nature, we receive that same quality. God is love. So we now have possessed love within our hearts. And it is to be displayed. And in 1 Corinthians 13, that whole chapter, think about what it says about love at the very end of it. First chapter 13, verse 13, it says, which one is the greatest? But the greatest of these is love. So love is the greatest when we think about it. It is the foundational quality that we are to have. And so in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, the great commandment, we are to love God and we are to love others. 
We're to love God first and foremost, and if we truly love God first and foremost, what are we going to do? We're going to love other people. We're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. But Jesus also gave another command in John chapter 13, verse 34. And it's specifically to believers in Jesus Christ. It's specifically to his followers. He says what? Love one another. We are to specifically love one another. And by this, the world will know that we are Christians. And just so you understand that we're to love everybody, like I said, we're to love God, we're to love our neighbor, we're to love one another, it's the body of Christ. But get this, we're also to love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. He speaks about that. Love your enemy. So you don't have a choice. You are supposed to love everyone. That doesn't mean you can treat everyone the same, but you can what? Love. And even your enemy, you understand that if they're doing unrighteousness, love should motivate us to correct them on that. And love should motivate us to, to see justice and righteousness prevail. But the fact that it is love, so we're to, to love God. We're to love one another. We're to love others. And we're to even love our enemy. But how does the world find love? It's all just, just turn on the television, watch the internet, YouTube, or whatever. And love is defined as, get this, it looks like it's defined as the works of the flesh. Those are the first ones that are mentioned in the works of the flesh. But the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, and promiscuity. That's how the world defines love today. It's all sexual related. In that sense, it's all sensual related. Haven't you heard phrases like this? You can't help who you love. And because you can't help who you love, who am I to say you're wrong in what you choose to do? Let's just say this, that outside of marriage, there's, it's all sexual immorality. God designed sex between a man and a woman in the bonds of marriage. Everything else is sexual immorality, moral promiscuity, moral impurity and promiscuity. It's what it is, and that's how the world is defined in love. We, as believers in Christ, know better. We look at 1 Corinthians 13, what do we see there? The quality is the love. So that's the foundational quality that you possess in your heart. You possess that as a believer in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this, who do you have animosity for? Who do you, who do you have hatred for? Let the fruit of the Spirit bubble up in cases like that. What else is there? Joy. Another foundation of all is joy. In James chapter 1, verse 2, get this right off the bat. He says what? Count it all joy. What? When you face what? Various trials and tribulations. Wait a minute. I don't know about you, but when I face trials and tribulations, I don't just get happy, right? I was working on my car yesterday. Actually, I've got to tell you, I bought a van, okay? You think, what? Lou and I are going to convert this van. We're going to live in it full time. No, just kidding. We are not going to live in that thing full time. Not by any stretch of the imagination. But in all this, we're going to try to convert it into a little, like, camera thing. And I'm working on this part, and I'm... Just so you know, you can't trust everything you see on YouTube, right? You can't trust everything you hear. And it said, you pull this piece off, and someone said, is that a coolant line or is that a vacuum line? Guys, that's a vacuum line. So I listened. I thought it was a vacuum line. And I pulled the hose. I got antifreeze going everywhere. Did I feel joy in that particular moment? No, I'm thinking, how did I listen to YouTube? You know? Why did I pay attention? But James says, what? Count it all joy when you face various trials. Joy. In fact, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, after the people have stood and listened to Ezra the scribe read the book of the law, they are so overcome. They're overcome because they realize they've been doing wrong. They're overcome because they've now heard the word of God, and they are told that the word of God says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice that the joy of the Lord is your strength. No matter what your circumstances, that joy that you possess, that is yours fully and completely, there's your strength. So when life seems overwhelming, think about the joy of the Lord. When life seems like it's crashing in on you, 
Think of the joy of the Lord. Think about this, those works of the flesh. The next two that came after the sexual immorality and moral impurity and promiscuity are idolatry and sorcery. You know, there's no joy in idolatry. There's no joy in sorcery. None whatsoever. Because the people live in fear. If that's what it's all based on, it's fear, knowing that, hey, you may never measure up. And that's why we have the joy of the Lord. Knowing it's not based on us, it's based on the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. And that leads to the third foundational problem, which is peace. So all followers of Jesus Christ possess peace. Notice this is peace with God. Romans 5, verse 1. We have peace with God what? through Jesus Christ. He came to reconcile us to the Father. Before we knew Jesus Christ, we were His enemies. Isn't it amazing? God loves His enemies. He loved us. And in the Gospel, He sent His Son, Jesus. And so we now have peace with God. No more uh, uh, acrimony with Him. No, no more separation from Him. We are at peace with God. But that also speaks about what the peace of God in Philippians 4, verse 7. We speak about having the peace of God. That quality that comes in. Again, when life comes crashing down, here comes that peace that passes all understanding. That you can trust in the Lord. That He's going to see you through whatever that is. And again, think about the works of the flesh. What comes next after idolatry and sorcery is what? Hatred, strife, jealousy. Where there's hatred, where there's strife, where there's jealousy, guess what? There's no peace. None, none whatsoever. You're not having peace with other people. You're not having peace with God. And you're not experiencing the peace of God. But know this. As a believer in Christ, you possess the peace of God. Peace with Him and His peace that passes all understanding. And as much as it depends upon you, what? Be at peace with all people. We can't always guarantee that. We can guarantee we can be at peace with God and at peace of God. So I'm going to try to classify these next three as just saying relational qualities. So all followers of Jesus Christ are given foundational qualities of love, joy, and peace, but also relational qualities. It's going to be what? Patience and kindness and goodness. Now patience, we understand that God Himself in Psalm 86, verse 15, that God is what slow to anger. I'm grateful for that. That God is slow to anger. Because He could be angry with us all the time, every day because of our sin, because of our rebellion against Him. But He is slow to anger with an abounding and faithful love. So patience is what you need to have when things don't go your way. Patience is what you need when uh, you're driving, right? And that person in front of you is texting. And the light turns green. And you know that this is a short light. And you're sitting behind and what do you want to do? Just tap your horn lightly? No, what do you want to do? You want to lay on that horn, right? You want to just lay, let them have, instead of having some patience. You know, who knows what may be going on there? You assume they're texting, you don't know. Have some patience. You guys know this is true, right? Don't pray for patience. Why? Because if you pray for patience, Lord, give me patience, guess what? He's going to put you in a situation where you need to have patience. Right? Call it the, the DMV line. Patience, right? You need to have that. Bought this van, it took me several weeks to get it registered. Why? Because of the line, you know, making an appointment, and what? Have patience. And we need to have that day in and day out. And you think about it, when you go down that works of the flesh, and I don't know if this corresponds directly, but it certainly seems like it does. It. The next one after hatred and strife and jealousy is what? Outbursts of anger. Outbursts of anger usually come because someone lacks patience. Right? Because we, we just have an outburst of wrath at someone because we have what? Lost our patience with that situation or that person or that individual. So know this, you have the patience of God within you because it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. 
and not just a little bit. He, he doesn't give the Spirit by measure. He gives His Spirit fully and completely. So relational qualities, patience, kindness. This is what being charitable, benevolent, and helping meet needs for others. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, we're told that the kindness, notice that the kindness of God is what meant to what? Lead us to repentance. He's patient with us. He's, he's wanting us to come to repentance, to come to that faith in Christ, to know Him. That's His quality. He gives that to us as well. Kindness that would come. Again, going through the works of the flesh, I think what would correspond with that would be what? Selfish ambitions. Selfish ambitions say, I'm looking out for me, and I don't care what happens to you. I'm not concerned with whether things are going all right for you or not. I'm just concerned with how it affects me. And if it's for my benefit, yeah, then I'll be kind. But if it's not for my benefit, I won't be kind. We're to show kindness fully and completely. Think about the kindness that God Himself gave to us. And so relational quality also goodness. This would be reacting to evil with goodness. Not repaying evil with evil, but repaying with kindness and goodness to someone. Doing good for others. Knowing that in truth, only Jesus Christ, only God Himself is good. We say all the time, oh, He's a good person. She's a good person. Ultimately, nobody's good. None of us are good. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. The rich young ruler calls Jesus. Well, good teacher, Jesus corrects him. In a sense, in this way, he says, Why do you call me good? There is one who is good, and that is God alone. Jesus could be called a good teacher. Why? Because he is God. But we must understand that only God is good, and we're to display his qualities. When we think about the works of the flesh, what goes along with that would be dissensions. That's the next one. When you compare that to that, dissensions are what causing division, not doing what is good for someone else, doing only what's good for yourself. So all followers of Jesus Christ are given found these foundational qualities. They're given these relational qualities. This last one I'm going to call confessional qualities. Confessional in the sense that we profess our faith in Jesus Christ. Because the first one there is what faithfulness. Faithfulness is what is mentioned here is the fruit of the Spirit. It's being reliable and trustworthy, but we must understand this about faith, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith, not just believing a bunch of facts, but faith that says, I trust in what the Word of God says. Faith that says, I'm obedient to what God says. So it's Hebrews 11, 1, that what, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Also, this faith is a gift. Faith is a gift from God. Ephesians first, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. What? And that not of yourselves is what? The gift of God. This fruit of the Spirit. Included with that is faith. Faithfulness. Being faithful to the Lord. God is faithful. And He will complete the work in you that He has started. God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. It says in 1 John chapter 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, what He is what faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this faithfulness means that we adhere to our faith in Christ. We keep His Word. It's interesting that the works of the flesh, if you go down, I think one that would correspond to this would be factions. Some translations may translate that heresies. It's creating false teachings which create different groups, subgroups within a congregation, within a denomination, within the body of Christ. These are factions and they're heresy and they are not being faithful. We are called to be what? Faithful to Jesus Christ. Faithful to His Word. Faithful to one another as the body of Christ. Kind of goes back to where He started from. Love God. Love one another. Love others. Be faithful. Also be what? Gentle. Another confession of quality is gentleness. Gentleness is being humble and submissive to God. To God and His Word. When we think about being gentle, it, we know what it's like when someone is harsh. 
we remember those kinds of things. But we also remember what someone who could have been harsh was gentle instead. And it makes a huge, huge difference. The Apostle Paul understood this. Look down in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. He says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Watching out for yourselves so you also won't be tempted with what a gentle spirit. Usually when people are harsh, it's when they want to blast somebody and point out some fault that they have because they want to lift themselves up. But we're not to do that. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, Jesus said, well, take the big log, take that big plank out of your eye before you go get the teeny tiny little speck out of your brother's eye. Because if you take that big log out of your eye, you're going to have a different attitude when you go talk to that person. And when we consider our own sinfulness, it will change our attitude when we go talk to someone. We want to confront them about sin. I think looking at the works of the flesh, one I think that would correspond to this would be envy also. Uh, maybe it's not a direct correlation, but envy says that you're upset with someone else. And gentleness is not part of that equation. Envy is not just, I want what you have. I'm mad that you have what you have. And I don't want you to have that anymore. So the confessional qualities when we also think about is self-control. Self-control. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound judgment. It also speaks of that self-control. In James chapter 3, verse 2, he talks about that if you're able to control your tongue, you can control the whole body. And if you can control the whole body, he's talking about this is the mark of maturity. If you can control what comes out of your mouth, you have a good chance of controlling the rest of it. It's an interesting correlation that he makes there. But he gives us the spirit, what? Fruit of the spirit of self-control. We don't have to be subject to the whims of this world and the sins of this world. I think it's interesting, again, the works of the flesh. When you look at the last ones that are listed there, what are drunkenness and carousing? There's not a lot of self-control in drunkenness and carousing and party life like that. So what is the word of God telling us here? I mean, it sums it all up here at the end. It says the law is not against such things. Has there ever been a law established that says don't love people? Has any government anywhere ever said that do not love people? Has any government anywhere said do not be kind to someone else? Has any law ever been put out there saying don't be good, don't be patient? No. These are all qualities that the world desires, but they don't possess as we possess. This is what makes the difference in the life of a believer, is knowing that we have the fruit of the Spirit. And it's evidence that we have been transformed and changed to be like Jesus Christ. And if you aren't displaying the fruit of the Spirit, if you aren't displaying these, if you're more characterized by the works of the flesh than you are by the fruit of the Spirit, you need to evaluate your heart and ask yourself, what's your excuse? What's your excuse for not displaying these things? You know, a farmer can look up there and say, hey, it was bad weather. Hey, I got bad seed. You know, he, he's got all these things that he can point to and be legitimate complaints because, hey, I couldn't get my harvest in because of these, these, and these. Do we as believers have that same option? No. We can't blame the weather for why we're not displaying the fruit of the Spirit. We can't blame our circumstances. We can't blame other people. We can't blame government. We can't blame anybody else because we have received the fruit of the Spirit and it is our job to display the fruit of the Spirit. You know, unfortunately, sometimes church people can be the most arrogant, rude, and impolite people. I mean, you've heard stories like this. A guest comes to the church and they come in and they sit down. You ever heard? I mean, y'all heard this type of thing before, right? And here comes some sweet, dear little saint of God 
who comes up and tells this young family that's been visiting for the first time, they haven't set foot in church in years, they're scared to come to church, and they sit down, and some dear, sweet little saint of God comes up to you're in my seat. And we laugh at that, but that is so unkind. That, 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 you know, are those people coming back? No. And it's like we sit there and think, well, that's, so, that's just the way people are. No, we shouldn't accept that. Not as a believer in Jesus Christ. No. We're to display the fruit of the Spirit. So if any of you got upset because someone sat in your seat, shame on you, right? Right? Let's, let's, you know, we can, we can laugh about it somewhat, but let's, let's be serious about this. We're to display the fruit of the Spirit all the time. So the next time you're in your car and you want to uh, toot the horn at someone, maybe it's, it's necessary, depending on the situation, you know, that first two is okay. But that second or third two, maybe that's, that's getting into the works of the flesh, right? Let's think about these things. Because this is what God wants us to display. God is not just throwing this out here. He's given this to us for us to measure ourselves to ask, are we displaying the fruit of the Spirit? So let me just give you three ways that you can make sure that you display the fruit of the Spirit. And we've already talked about it. But I think we need to meditate on it. That's why I want you to memorize the Scripture and understand it. Why I want you to also share it with someone else. Number one, love God. Love God. Love God first. Reach upward. Are you reaching upward to God in worship? Worship as we gather as the body of Christ. And are you reaching up toward God during the week as well? But we must do so together. So are you reaching upward? Are you that's loving God? Are you loving one another? Are you loving other believers in Christ? You seek to love one another means you have to spend some time with each other. And sometimes when we spend time with each other, it's what we have to have. Patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, all of those things, right? We, we need to have those things. But we are called to what? Love one another. So are you in a situation where you can love other believers in Christ as part of the body of Christ? If not, then you need to find some believers that you can, can love on because we are to love one another. So I would say, you know, the first one, loving God, are you reaching upward? Loving others, one another, other believers, are you teaching inward? Are we reaching inward to one another to build one another up? And then finally, are you loving others? Are you loving your neighbor? Are you serving in some capacity to share the love of God? Are we serving outward? Think about that. Up, in, out. It's pretty simple. And I think if we would be focused on those things, guess what? The works of the flesh will fall by the side. The fruit of the Spirit can bubble up because we'll be doing what God's called us to do. So let me just ask you, what's your excuse? What is your excuse for not displaying the fruit of the Spirit? Whatever excuse it is, it doesn't count. Because the fruit of the Spirit is given to you by God for His glory. So for you not to display the fruit of the Spirit is to rob God of His glory. We don't want to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, and I praise You for this time and this day. We ask that, Lord, You would anoint and bless us to just understand where we stand before You, how we stand before You. We can only stand before You because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, if there's anyone that's never trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, may they turn from sin and turn to Jesus, which means, Lord, to, to forsake the things of this world and to cling to Christ. Lord, for those that are your followers, and Lord, maybe they're displaying more of the works of the flesh, may they just examine and say, where, why that's happening? Are they not worshiping you? Are they not loving one another? Are they not loving others? Help them to see where they're falling short so that, Lord, none of us fall short of your glory. Lord, I just thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.